Hi, good evening and welcome everyone. This is Subramanian from Collabra, a training consultant and a software practitioner. I've uh, been in the industry for about 20 years and uh, started with uh, Java in the year uh, 2020. And from there, I moved on to several technologies, right? Java, then from there, moved on to J2E platforms, did a bit of, did a bit of uh, uh, Linux and uh, Windows networking, uh, did some things on EMC, uh, went into projects which had Oracle, a little a bit of DBA. So I was a practitioner and as well a, a training consultant. Um, then uh, from there, moved on to Enterprise Java Beans, Spring Framework, Hibernate, and uh, currently more on to the front-end technologies that is Java, Java based on JavaScript and TypeScript, uh, ideally Angular and uh, React. So uh, having a broad umbrella of uh, term of uh, technologies in my kitty uh, i am uh, glad to uh, make this presentation today and uh, take everybody through a journey on full stack development with java microservices and angular so we are going to get onto a thousand feet overview of full stack development with java microservices and angular this has always been a hot topic and trending of course, this would also be accompanied by DevOps, cloud, everything together. So uh, what we'll be looking at is what is full stack development? What are the technologies we've been using a full stack development project? And uh, we'd have a workflow of how a project would be built end to end with all these technologies, the complete technology stack, which would be a diagram um, at the end. So let's, uh, let me introduce uh, Cognitia. So we are the world's uh, leading talent transformation company. And uh, uh, we have quite a lot of achievements under our kitty. So we have like 150,000 professionals uh, trained worldwide and 7,000 industry veterans as instructors. We have talent development centers in about 55 countries and 80 million now fully owned uh, subsidiary dollar, sorry, dollar 800 million are fully owned the subsidiary of Collabra Group. Uh, if you look at the training, we are into Red Hat, we are a Microsoft certified uh, partner, ITIL, uh, we are into AWS um, cloud, and uh, that's a brief introduction about uh, Cognitia. So if you look at uh, uh, Collabra, yes, uh, Cognitia is a, a sister concern of Collabra, and uh, we mainly look at uh, machine learning and AI, microservices, robotic process automation, Internet of Things, uh, DevOps, cloud computing, cybersecurity, professional development, and BI technology. What part are we going to see today? We'll be looking at microservices. Like most of you would have uh, heard the terminology microservices or would be in the process of uh, migrating from a monolith to a microservice. And uh, definitely, yes, today, uh, many enterprise projects are built on microservices. So let me start with uh, why did microservices first come up? We all know Netflix and we know the traffic on Netflix and uh, Netflix is one of the fan companies. And what really happened is uh, once Netflix went down and all the engineers tried to put uh, the application together and they found a semicolon was missing. And uh, they figured out it was a monolith and the entire uh, Netflix went down because of a semicolon missing and there was downtime and yes, it led to a loss in the uh, business. So my, uh, Netflix were the pioneers of microservices. Basically, they took a big uh, monolith application, which was running on a server, right, full-fledged uh, server, which is a high infrastructure cost as well. And uh, scaling them out was a challenge. So Netflix broke the monolith application down into microservices, and they are the pioneers who started the uh, microservices. And they contributed a lot of uh, microservices module to the open source community, which uh, Spring, the Spring uh, community started using. So we look at what microservices are and uh, why are we primarily looking at uh, microservices here and how is it related to full stack development? We'll also be looking at the broader spectrum, like we are not going to straight away build microservices like a Java application. Indeed, we are going to have a suite of technologies which are coming together. So we'll also look at the broader spectrum. So let's look at full stack development. 
uh, what is full stack development? What is in it for me? So the full stack, the, the word full stack development uh, literally is based on the context. So when I say a full stack, I would be able to do an application end to end. And again, end to end literally means what? So let's say like I'm building an application like Amazon. I could build a web app. I could build a database. I could uh, take care of the network. I could uh, take care of uh, deployment of an application. I could take, I would take care of uh, testing. So it's a really a broad spectrum, but let's uh, put it in a nutshell or let's put it more in the context of development from the development perspective. So this is the uh, uh, general set or suite of technologies which we select for full stack development. And looking at this, we have your start with Java. So Java 7, Java 8, Java 11, they are the long term uh, support. And uh, that's basically the language which we're going to uh, select for full stack development. We can do full stack development using .NET. We can do full stack development using uh, JavaScript, which is the new kid in the block. Not exactly new, but for the last uh, decade, JavaScript was the most underrated uh, uh, language before uh, the last decade. And uh, like last 10 years, uh, JavaScript is the you know most trending platform. What we'll be doing here is uh, we'll look at full stack development on the Java platform. So we'll, we would be a programmer with our existing skills doing development with Java. That is the base. What are we going to do with Java? We'll be building web applications and enterprise level applications in full stack. So we'll build applications and we'll test them, right? Unit test. And we'll also know um, the operations, like not only development, the operations. For example, we'll be able to host an application onto a server, not complete, uh, you know, hosting end to end. But uh, if there is you know any support required for hosting we would really be aware of how are we going to host the application so literally a full stack uh, developer kind of does the database does um, the uh, the programming or the business logic part uh, does the tools so the tools required like git and github devops right uh, takes part in deployment so a full stack developer kind of uh, does things end to end and would be specialized in one area. So if we get into a full stack project development, let's say we would know the Linux platform. If we are working on Windows and our project is Linux, we should be ready to learn the Linux platform. We may pick up Java. We may pick up Apache Tomcat or WebLogic as a server. Then uh, we may pick up a, a database, which is MySQL or Oracle. Uh, we would also bring Spring spring and spring boot for enterprise application development and it doesn't stop over there so this is what a traditional java developer does now what does a full stack developer do so he may also work with a nosql database like mongodb he may take the application and deploy it on the cloud he would be building microservices and he'd also be building a front-end application with with angular or react so uh, to cut it short as a full stack developer from the Java background, I would be able to build applications with Java uh, and Java frameworks like uh, Spring, uh, Spring Boot, uh, JSF, all the Java frameworks. Plus, I would also be able to take care of uh, a source code management. So I'd be working on tools like uh, Git and uh, GitHub or any tool which the organization uses. We'll be looking at CI and CD, continuous integration and continuous deployment, like uh, we'd be using Jenkins. Plus, we'll also understand how to take our application and deploy it onto the cloud. And we would have been working with the relational databases. Now we are also going to work on non-relational databases or NoSQL databases like MongoDB. So kind of more from just the Java front, we'll be getting into Git and more into Git if you're already working into Git we would get into DevOps. So Git, all Git and Docker, all these things come into DevOps. Docker is used for containerizing our application and then moving it onto the cloud. So if I enter into the project or if we enter into a project, we'll be able to build enterprise applications with the Java platform. Using frameworks like uh, Spring and Spring Boot, we'll be able to build uh, the presentation layer, application layer, data layers. This is a part of the architecture. 
we'll be able to build monoliths and we'll also be able to build microservices which is the modern way of building applications we would be able to use the spring cloud modules which was inspired and a lot of uh, you know work done by netflix has all come into spring cloud that's what open source community is all about we'll be able to build microservices spring cloud modules and dockerize the application so we'll talk about what docker is docker is containerization take our application with the software required and put it onto a container and then deploy it onto a cloud like amazon so it's not an individual we'll be a part of the team who will be doing all these activities deploy it into aws or if you are using a google cloud platform gcp or azure or uh, let us say like yeah google platform or azure or any cloud which we look at apart from this we are building the back end we'll be building restful services we'll be building uh, microservices and now we are not going to say like i'll only stick with java uh, at a point of time we will be moving on to the javascript platform too so we'll also be working on the front end so it's like you can say like two full stacks in one but uh, primarily i would not distinguish between both of them because you are going to only build the back end nowadays you're not going to use jsp or servlets or even more, most probably jsf but for the front end you are going to use angular or react so splitting this when we look at a, a meaningful picture covering all these backend technologies now spring boot comes as the backend technology because the front end is going to be angular or react so we'll be doing javascript we'll be doing typescript we'll be doing angular and we'll be doing react now what happens on the other side is uh, is all these platforms javascript and sorry uh, angular and react angular by google and react by uh, facebook so angular is a framework and react is a front end uh, library which is used for building modern state of the art applications like facebook and uh, if you look at google's products they use a lot of uh, angular so angular was built uh, for in-house use similarly react was built for in-house use angular for google and react for facebook and they have open sourced it and that is available to the entire community so now we'll also move on to the javascript platform we'll be using typescript with angular javascript and jsx with react plus we'll be able to completely deploy a database with a team so most probably will not be going to full-fledged deployment rather we would be our core would be building the application and what would be on the circumference is we'll be able to deploy the application we'll be able to dockerize the application and we'll be part of uh, these teams so what i would say like uh, or what i would uh, really mention here is uh, now a couple of years back if i'm a developer i only do development and i would uh, not talk about anything related to deployment or anything else or anything related to the front end that is taken care of by another team but now we are going to seamlessly work with the uh, uh, the developer and operations we are also going to work with the system operations team so if they say like okay we've given you the privileges here now you can make a dockerized container and host it so it um, comes to a common understanding you know that real line of what uh, the systems engineer should take care and what the developer should take care is a healthy understanding and now we would also spread that flavor from just development on to you know devops so looking into this broad picture these are a set of technologies which a full stack developer would ideally work so java we'll build monolith applications or microservices applications using java we would uh, use spring boot for uh, quickly building applications using the spring framework we will be building microservices and deploying them with spring cloud modules and the application would be hosted onto aws as a cloud so we'll also have knowledge on the cloud uh, the minimal operational knowledge required for us to deploy an application on the cloud although we'll not be doing full-fledged on the cloud then coming to this side here yeah, relational databases like mysql tools like uh, git earlier we were using subversion so now primarily there is a lot of work going on uh, git relational databases like mysql and oracle and uh, 
NoSQL databases like MongoDB. So MongoDB is the new kid in the block. To a traditional uh, Java developer, the new kids in the block would be Docker, would be Spring Cloud and Spring Boot, Spring Spring Cloud, Cloud and Microservices with Spring Boot, with the uh, backend like MongoDB. So literally, what we'll be doing here is we'll be an agile project, and uh, agile project itself means like we quickly organize into teams and we build a project and it's like three months to six months maybe we'll be doing a project and then move on to the next so ideally a full stack developer would be able to gel into the agile team right and uh, picking up the different set of technologies so let's say here it's mysql we'd be working with mysql if the next project demands mongodb yes we'll be working with mongodb we work with aws next if it's google cloud platform yeah we'll be doing this mainstream we'll be doing java development along with this entire set of tools around now what what is the central pivot in uh, learning microservices is basically monolith has a lot of challenges they are good for certain purposes and uh, microservices are you know the modern way of building applications and uh, monoliths have certain advantages and disadvantages microservices have their own advantages and disadvantages it does not necessarily mean every application should be a microservice or every application should be a monolith uh, right so excitement may make us uh, try to push monoliths into microservices but ideally speaking uh, there are several projects where i've seen where they took microservices and applied them and then it did not turn out to be as successful as a monolith so we need to really find out the projects and then you know the requirements of the project and then find out whether microservice fit in or a monolith app fit in so ideally when you are trying to build a microservice uh, generally we follow this pattern we build if it's a new project we build a minimal uh, monolith make it functional and then start breaking it down and migrating into microservices test them so we can really look at uh, you know the migration in a seamless manner from monolith to microservices so that would be like uh, a fail safe way of uh, trying to do something or managing the risks when moving from a monolith to a microservices project all right what is microservices architecture like uh, now here we see a monolith if we take this monolith everything will be inside all the functionality of the application will be in one application or a group of applications which are deployed as one bundle onto a server uh, most probably a large-scale enterprise server and if we need to scale it out, we need expensive infrastructure again. Now, what happens when it's a microservice? Let's say uh, we have an e-commerce shop like Amazon and the entire Amazon app is now going to run on one uh, box, although maybe there is redundancy, but the business logic, the UI elements, everything is going to be deployed as one unit. What we do over here is we'll split the modules, like product modules will be one microservice, orders module will be another microservice and each microservice can have its own database so microservices are independent of each other so coming back to this picture let's say we build a site e-commerce site if we build a monolith we'll have one database typically my mysql and uh, the functionality will be written with a java application and mysql may be the database now microservices give us gives us the choice right let's say like we want a new module called offers so what we can do is the existing modules can still keep using mysql the new modules can start using mongodb so each microservice is independent of the other the first microservice may use mysql with java and it may use uh, react as the front end the second microservice may use angular as the front end it may be built with dotnet platform or the javascript platform node basically node based application and it may connect with the uh, mongodb so let's take java with the relational database and this is a node application with javascript now this is the product module and this is the offers module and uh, the other the third module can be built with the dotnet platform and my microsoft sql server so what what do we actually understand by this is 
individual teams can completely build applications based on their infrastructure with their set of tools and one applic one microservice may be deployed onto gcp google cloud platform and the other microservice may be deployed onto aws ideally we may not do this if situation if there are applications running and we are migrating new applications or building new applications on another cloud we can do this it is a possibility so microservices allow us to do polyglot programming so in a team we may have a node developers we may have java developers we may have uh, uh, javascript developers who are all participating and building the project now the complexity here is since this is running each application is a, a individual each application is individual and can run completely on its own with its own database and logic right the complexity here is if the uh, the products module needs to interact with the accounts module we are going to do inter process communication primarily but here it's intra process so there are pros and cons uh, for monolith as well as the microservice architecture but the winning point here is there is no single point of failure so if one module fails the other module is still working and it's very easy to scale microservices on the cloud because they're very lightweight when compared to monoliths so putting things in a nutshell here a monolith application puts all its functionality into a single process so if it fails everything is gone and it scales by replicating the monolith on multiple servers so we need to take the monolith that's a gigantic application and put it across different boxes here and still run them so it's expensive uh, to set up the infrastructure so let's say an e-shopping e-commerce business does well in the first quarter and next quarter it's not the season so for the first quarter we'll need four boxes and for the next quarter we'll only need two so what are we going to do with the remaining servers right they're going to most probably lie unused so one thing i've observed is in a monolith application we always scale the infrastructure to the maximum and then what happens is a lot of uh, you know the valuable resources are unused because we are looking at the you know maximum infrastructure required and the Ideally, the entire infrastructure is not used at, at uh, a single point of time. Whereas in microservices, we can always scale. And this is where the cloud comes into use pay as you use. So they give you the complete infrastructure, a right? platform as a service, pass, software as a service, right? So we get uh, uh, the software and we get the platforms, everything through the cloud. And let's say first quarter business is up, so we can scale them up and AWS does it for us and we need to pay. And the next quarter, let's say business is down and we only need half the resources. We'll only need to pay half the resources. So Microsoft's are very helpful for startups as well because they can deploy it, they can choose their cloud provider and they can easily deploy it. And the cost becomes very, very less. Uh, so if we ask a question, um, like okay can't we deploy monoliths onto the cloud you can but then um, the ideal situation is you'll have it in your own data center and on your own uh, servers running ideally microservices are like deployed onto the cloud for scalability so this is the architecture here monolith versus microservices and then if we look at uh, this what what does microservice architecture say so i would say like this is a mindset when you're building a microservices architectural style primarily it's the mindset which we get into so we're going to build a single application as a suite of small services and each service can be built by a team so we know like uh, you know agile team as jeff bezos the founder of amazon said typically in an agile team you should not have more members than you know sharing a pizza and eating Right. So if we get a pizza, how many members can share that and eat? I guess a pizza or two, uh, Jeff Bezos has said. So literally it's like four members should be in a team and they can literally build a small service, deploy it individually, and the team can be closely knit. The other team can work independently. Mm -hmm. So we build a suite of small services, each one running its own process. So as we said, the service can be not just in one language, it can be polyglot. So most probably we will see Node.js applications running and, and uh, we will also see mostly JavaScript applications will be running on a Node.js environment and Java applications will be running on a JVM, right? 
uh, and each one will be running on its own process, communicating with the lightweight mechanisms as HTTP. This is where we looked at inter-process communication, the communication between two different processes. Now, I would say like uh, mig migrating from monolith to microservices would be kind of like a, a new learning. Uh, reason is the mindset and how you would split like you would have to decide on how much should go into a microservice It's not the smallest functionality, but how much should go into a microservice you should uh, Decide on how many microservices can use a single database or each microservices needs its own database. You should decide on Where where do you put it on the cloud which uh, geographical area? So these are things which you really need to understand when creating uh, microservices and apart from that the way we write microservices is different from monoliths so in microservices our focus will be on developing and coordinating between microservices in monolith everything happens within the same jvm so what happens is uh, the function calls are intra process but uh, in a microservice it is like you will have numerous services running at different uh, different locations on the cloud how are we going to coordinate these microservices? So let me take one example. When we look at uh, the session management in a web application, we store the session on a specific server or on the web server, right? Uh, now, when we come to a set of microservices, when you get to the products and you make a purchase and it goes to the cart and you have a transaction, so the product service has to send that same request to the cart service and then the cart service should send the same uh, transaction to uh, cart when you buy it yeah the same request will go through uh, the transaction microservice now we need to do some distributed tracing so there are challenges we need to monitor which microservice is up and which microservice is down we need to look at load balancing if there are like 10 instances of microservices how is load going to be uh, uniquely how is load going to be distributed on these microservices and if we are going to look at uh, fault tolerance in a microservice we'll call multiple applications application one calls two two calls three three calls four and to add to this complexity each application may have its own database right so now think of databases one may have MySQL, another have, may have MongoDB, right? So microservices gives us this possibility. How are we going to actually manage the transactions between two different databases? So we'll be looking at something interesting like Saga patterns, right? a lot of design patterns and very, very interesting. Complex, interesting, and uh, we've been building monoliths for a long period of time and it's time to roll up and build the microservices architecture, which will keep us very excited and interesting. So I think I've addressed all the complexities in a nutshell. And as I said, this the presentation here is like more from the necessary necessity point of microservices from an architectural perspective and from the tool sets, what we'll be using and finally the developer. So I would say like when you learn the microservices, start with understanding the architecture, right? Even the developer needs to have a small uh, flair of architecture although the architect will go into the details uh, developer needs to know about the architecture developer needs to know about the systems developer needs to know about uh, more on the network because it's just not a monolith developer needs to work on distributed uh, computing from day one developer needs to work with other teams which are working with another set of uh, tools as microservices also appreciates polyglot programming now moving on from here, what is the benefit of microservices? Now let's say uh, we'll take a fictitious company uh, which is doing uh, e-commerce. So we'd uh, say fict Ficti Shop, right? What does Ficti Shop do now? Let's say they are operating their business and they want to now establish a new business capability right for example let's say they were not delivering products to home they would like to deliver their projects to they, they would like to deliver their products to uh, the customer's home right now the new business capability can entirely be built differently it need not uh, link 
with the existing software or platform so services are built around business capabilities you can build um let's say we had a monolith with java now we can build this business we have an agile team which is working on um, the javascript platform node and angular and react right express js and like how we build applications in java now node.js also empowers javascript developers to build the same kind of applications you can create restful web services with the node and uh, you can like how java connects with the sql you can have uh, node applications connecting with uh, no sql right so you can definitely build applications around business capabilities and quickly deliver them so microsoft services connects tightly with the agile so as i said the mindset of a microservices developer is like i've done this project for three months and i worked on um, the java platform majority of my work with uh, you know little uh, angular and react and my next project if i'm going into a project which is using angular primarily with a bit of java development if you are ready here i think we are a real you know full stack developer so it's it's really hard to just stick with the java technology because tomorrow when you need the front end technologies it would go with like how a java developer works with a back end so there was a combination for java and oracle we had that combination for years from year 2000 and uh, till 2010 we had this combination but now it's more of a spring boot microservices with angular and react so that is where you know the real necessity of a java developer to move on to javascript platforms comes in so we write independently deployable modules so i would have deployed my projects onto aws cloud the next project may on get onto gcp cloud we should be ready for that bare minimum of centralized management in a monolith everything was centralized but here it is distributed and most probably it will be on the cloud we really don't know where it is and may be written in different programming languages so we should appreciate and uh, let's say we are moving into another team it says like we are building a new module on on uh, javascript platforms it will be good we can kick start and at least support that team there uh, it would not be great if you're only sticking to the java language as i again said this is the context where they will always uh, the front end is not like jsf front end is angular we know as java developers we did the uh, servlet jsps and uh, jsf uh, many tools like prime faces rich faces and then now it's more of angular so if we get into a project they look at okay we are doing the front end with angular and react can you help us out so imagine like you have done your work it's complete on the java platform and you extend your support to the other team so full stack uh, developer uh, here i would say like primarily doing java and also doing the front end like how you do the back end of oracle also you know the extended support or extended expertise will be on the front end framework so there's a lot in the microservices architectural style and what are the characteristics now this is vital one important thing which we look at is domain specific we look at what is domain driven design so what happened earlier is we had the requirements uh, given um, by the customer so business analyst would give them and we would have the architect uh, designing all the technical uh, specifications architect would design the entire application we would have the developers doing the development testers doing the testing and then deployment which will go to our operations uh, team or the deployment team and maintenance now what happened earlier is we had time when compared to modern day applications once agile has kicked in uh, work is like you know there's a lot of work going on uh, agile team more than what was happening in the waterfall uh, model because we had teams for years in the waterfall model agile it's like you have uh, for a year if you have the same team we are really lucky there mm -hmm. so when it comes to agile um, we are very quick on addressing the business needs so any change in the business we doing agile projects quickly deliver quickly deliver and empower the business by building our applications 
So what happened is now the business analyst speaks different terminology. For example, if we take telecom, right, we may say as a plan, right? For example, we may say as a plan, let's say, say you have a, a, a plan for your internet from AT&T, or if it's in India, we may say like we have a plan for uh, Atel. So everyone does not use the word plan, right? So it may be a plan, and maybe the technical team may use subscription. And what happens if there are multiple teams using different terminologies? So basically the architect may use a different terminology for the classes which he designs and in the business they may use a different terminology. So what happens here is there is a disconnect in the way the business people speak and uh, how technical people speak. So that's why generally we had technical meetings separately and then we had uh, you know the business analysts would do something different and then the architect would actually connect and merge the requirements between these two teams now things have become domain specific so when we say domain specific right for example as i said it may be a plan or it may be a subscription so if they say it's a plan we are not going to write a class called specification we'll write a class called plan so based on your domain we will derive the context and from the context we will start designing our application so that in an agile when all the stakeholders uh, meaning uh, the business analyst and uh, everybody around right plus the development team the architect everybody sits into the call and we discuss we'll all have a unique terminology which will be applied into the projects as well right which is derived from the domain so that's a very interesting topic you can look into it domain driven design so when you look at microservices it's great to build domain driven it's great to implement domain driven design because you are speaking the same terminology which the you know domain experts speak and we'll have lots of discussions with the domain specialists domain experts and now whenever a requirement needs to be changed right the technical team understands it very quickly from the domain experts and when some change is happening here, we communicate the same to the business team as well. So it's domain specific, loosely coupled, multiple independent deployment, sorry, independent development teams, fault tolerant services, it's service based and it is continuous delivery. So every week or fortnight, if we can deliver a microservice, let's say a fortnight. Now coming to domain driven design, it is, it's, it's a feast when you look at uh, designing the applications because there was a disconnect between the business team and the technical team. Literally we had a very big documentation for requirement specification and then, you know, there was a different uh, technical team, kind of the developer does not speak directly to the business analyst if something is uh, required, maybe a little interaction, but not full fledged uh, interaction. But when it comes to agile, you can always interact. And uh, the reason why, another reason why uh, developers may not interact with a business analyst is the terminologies which they use and the terminologies which we use inside the product is very different. So implementation, I would say like there's a gap between um, the terminology used in the domain and uh, domain or by the business experts and the terminology used um, when it comes to the implementation of the software product. So what happens here is we'll take a complex business logic and we will derive a ubiquitous language. So in short saying ubiquitous language means we will have a terminology for that particular module or for that particular context, domain context, right? Take the domain. So when I say domain, it could be e-commerce domain. And then inside that we can break it down into subdomains. So subdomains could be the product subdomain, could uh, be the uh, uh, finance subdomain or could be the order subdomain, right? Then uh, it could be the offer subdomain. You can basically break down a domain into smaller subdomains, understand the context and develop a ubiquitous language. So what does that mean? The products team may use something different from the sales team. So a ubiquitous language for the sales module will closely be integrated with the sales team and the team which is building the microservices for sales 
So they may use a terminology called plan. That is, they can use plan here. And when it uh, comes to, this, that's a sales team. And when it comes to the products team, they may call it as subscription. So let's say one team is building the microservices for sales and another team is building a microservice for products. So we have two different domains and the ubiquitous language is applicable to each subdomain. So as I said, e-commerce is the domain. We split it into the product subdomain and we split it into the uh, sales subdomain, right? And each domain which we split is centered around the business functionalities. So now what happens? right from here when we are in the sales domain everybody um, related to sales will all speak the same terminology so we first derive the ubiquitous language and we put it onto it's like a dictionary which is only meaningful to that particular context meaning the subdomain right and we have some boundaries so this is where uh, domain driven design comes to put it short we take the domain we split it into subdomains for each subdomain the business team and the technical team interact together they find out the common names which are used and that is how we'll be using right even in our classes for example if we say plan plan is what we'll be using developer will use plan tester will use plan and the business analyst will also say plan so that is how we can quickly you know solve the business requirement so an architect finds it easy a developer finds it easy um business analyst finds it easy so we don't need you know hefty documentations and we don't need to uh, you know try to read the document of what business analyst gives us and then you know try to understand like how will it go technically the language is ubiquitous so complex business logic we, we need to solve so in that in this scenario or in that uh, picture what happens is you get to really solve the problem quickly because now the gap between the technical team and the business team has been closed that's why we start with domain driven design and microservices goes along with ddd it's not mandate to use ddd for all microservices then again if it's a complex project right you'll have complex business logic for example banking is very very complex so you we the technical team will know how the business happens but the business analyst is the person who is specialized when we communicate with the same jargons even a team member who's coming who's coming newly into a project knows that he needs to use this ubiquitous language so earlier projects we didn't have the ubiquitous language the modern projects which have ddd and microservices we use ubiquitous language next we are moving on uh, so coming quickly through this putting things in a nutshell so we looked at uh, the world of full stack development and this is a gist of technologies which are placed here you can definitely add based on your interest and you can you can add technologies and based on your interest and the requirements we saw monolith versus microservices we saw what is microservices architecture style we looked at the microservices characteristics and we also looked at domain driven design so as a developer i moved from building monoliths to microservices and i also started doing angular and react so now i'm a full stack developer with um, a little connect with all the devops tools and next moving on i'm going to build complex projects with microservices so i also understand domain driven design mainly the architects uh, do the design here and uh, the other team the developers and and the testers, everybody is going to use the ubiquitous language. So there'll be a lot of work. This could be a little challenging as well as interesting when we are deriving the ubiquitous language. So what happens here is business moves real fast. We need applications which can scale quickly with lesser cost. We have teams with different capabilities. We can use them, right? Agile teams. So if a team is specialized in Node and if you find like some functionality business functionality can be implemented with node we let it to that team and if we find there's a new requirement and that could be built with spring boot we can use polyglot uh, programming here we saw the different characteristics and this was the important thing so uh, i would highly recommend have an awareness about domain driven design and if you get a chance to work on microservices with domain driven design that would be really fantastic because you will know like productivity shoots up 
and uh, the product gets uh, delivered quickly and it helps you know, solving complex problems. Next, uh, we uh, come to Spring Boot. Now coming to the flare of uh, Java technologies, Spring Boot allows you to create standalone production grade applications which you can run. So it's like olden days, it was like um, you were traveling olden days, development was like you were traveling in a, a, a simple car and now you are traveling, you know, in the most modern car, right? Let's say a driverless car. So all you need to do is uh, Spring Boot helps you take care of all the boilerplate code. Then it tries to take care of all the non-productive uh, work for you. So as a developer, you really focus on business. So if you look from the first slide, the whole thing is we are trying to do everything to make our business, right? Or to make our customer happy and build this business very quickly. Right? We are having Microsoft. So we say the customer, we can quickly build and deploy it for you. No problems with the infrastructure, right? And pay the minimum required. When you're not using, you don't need to pay. We are using our teams, right? We don't need to hire a new team. If we have uh, different teams, yes, we can uh, try to pull in all the resources and quickly build applications. We quickly understand the customer requirements in a complex project. And at the end, customer is happy because in two weeks, he gets a small module which is deployed and it is running. Now we moved on to technology. We understood we are working on Spring Boot and Spring Boot is a modern way of building Spring Framework. Spring Boot is not a different version of Spring or Spring Boot is not a alternate product of uh, Spring. Spring Boot is a modern way of building Spring applications. So it's an opinionated framework. It has opinions, enables a rapid development RAD. You can create standalone applications and just run them. It's highly productive and it takes care of everything like embedded Tomcat. You can switch on to other servers as well. Next, uh, we are looking at microservices. Build small self-contained. That means the business logic, the UI, uh, everything can be contained as a single application. When I say a single application, you may deploy the UI on a separate machine. You may build deploy the uh, business logic on a separate machine. You may deploy the database on a separate machine. Collectively, all these would contribute to a microservice. So build small self-contained ready to app run applications that can bring great flexibility and add resilience to your code. So if you need to visualize this, think of an elephant and uh, you know thousand ants doing the job. So if the elephants fall sick, nothing happens for that day. So elephant is gigantic. If you need to buy another elephant, it is costly. So the same analogy can be used to Microsoft, but ants, each one will keep, if one ant is not well, the other ants can still keep doing their job. Each ant can do of their job in a different way. And we have looked at real ants. Whenever they go on a line, they have a message or they communicate and they reach from one point to another ants in a disciplined way. But how do these ants communicate with each other? That becomes a, a challenge. And complexity is there in managing a thousand ants when coming compared to a elephant. So this, this analogy really helps us understand the difference. So now we have cloud modules. As I said, these are all inspired and came down from Netflix. Quickly, what do cloud modules have? We have different patterns like, uh, let's say, okay, if you ask, uh, like how do we store the configuration? You may have the configuration on um, uh, Git, stored on Git, right? And uh, you can allow microservices to access them. So configuration can be stored on, uh, uh, source code control system and microservices can uh, read them. So how how are this, how is this common pattern done? So we have, uh, you know, Spring Cloud configuration uh, module, which helps you take care of this. Let's say multiple microservices are running. How does one microservice find out another microservice? We have the pattern for service discovery. Like uh, we can register a microservice and the client can search the microservice. So all that comes onto the Spring Cloud. Let's move on next. Now, as I said, Netflix. Now, Spring Cloud projects, there are many projects there. We have Netflix OSS integrations. 
with uh, Spring. Now, right then we have uh, auto configuration. So as I said, like we can implement auto configuration. We can have service discovery, like how we register Google pages onto a Google server and the whole world finds out. We search Google and we find all the you know, other sites. Similarly, we can um, register all our microservices onto the service discovery. The service discovery here is the Eureka server. Next, we'll say like uh, load balancing. There are multiple microservices. And uh, let's say like in the e-commerce app, in the Ficti shop app, there are like uh, thousands of users who log in at the same time and would like to do an order. How do we, how many microservices do we bring up and how do we ensure that the load is balanced? All that can be done with the uh, load balancing. And what happens uh, when there is a chain of microservice call and if one mic, there is a chain of let's say five microservice calls and the fourth microservice fails, what about the state management and all the other three microservices? What about that request? How do we trace the request from microservice one, two, three, and four? How do we handle faults in a complex scenario like that. So we have you know, complex uh, fault management systems. Now that's where Hystrix come in. We have other modules as well. So this, these are the traditional modules which we have used earlier. Some of the Spring Cloud. So from Spring Boot, you will move on to Spring Cloud. Spring Cloud are like Spring Cloud Config. What does it do? It helps externalize configuration. Now, the, in a monolith, we would have the configuration inside the same box, but here the configuration may be on an external server. We can connect. The microservices can connect from the configure connect to the configuration server and read the configurations. And we can also ensure that when a configuration change uh, happens, right, we can. Um, uh, broadcast that change and all the other microservices can pick up the pick up the new configuration next uh, spring cloud sloth what does it do it traces the request distributed tracing so as i said like if a request goes through five microservices what happens is it completely traces the request between all the microservices so distributed tracing Next, from here on, we move to the next part, which is the client, the rich uh, UI applications. So what do we do with Angular? Angular is the newer, uh, I would not say version. Earlier, we had Angular JS. That's a different product altogether. And uh, that was good on its own. But uh, there were certain challenges which were addressed by Angular. So Angular JS is different from Angular. Angular JS was the old product, and Angular is the newer product, right? So what does Angular help us do? It helps us build single-page applications. Now, you know, like JSF, JSP, JSF, all these are actually processed on the server, and then you get the HTML which is thrown onto the client but uh, ideally speaking html is something which natively runs on your browser and it has browser power earlier browsers were not as powerful as servers but now browsers can do a lot they can completely run an application right? and uh, we have many tools now on javascript so as i mentioned javascript is one of the most powerful languages now so we build an application a web application as a single html page and we can do the, all the navigation routing and all we need to do is get the data from the server and what what would be you know anything compared or what would be something better than your browser natively running the application and rendering all the information so you build a single page application for web mobile native desktop and native mobile so it's like cross platform we'll bring in angular and now what 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 is the change here from do, doing JSP servlets and JSF? We kind of go with the RESTful web services with Spring Boot. We move on to microservices. And finally, we build front end applications with Angular. So ideally in full stack, uh, you'll be having Git. You will be having um, Spring, Spring Boot, uh, microservices, a relational database like uh, MySQL, a non-relational database, NoSQL database like Mongo.
and uh, for the front end instead of JSP and uh, servlets you will be having an application um, which is running on angular and you'll be learning uh, details about node or at least an introduction or at least how to set up node and uh, run an application on node when you build angular applications they can be easily deployed onto the browser from a node server right so we look at uh, that and you can also look at react library from there you can move on to the react library so if you do angular and if you also move on to react then we can build applications end to end now what what do you move from there you get into developing complex applications uh, using uh, uh, microservices architecture and domain driven design you can build and deploy cloud-based scalable and fault tolerance applications so from uh, as i mentioned uh, from java 7 java 8 java 11 right we move on from jsp servlets to jsf from jsf we move on to uh, angular and uh, react you can pick up anything to start with i would recommend uh, do both to understand both better and from there we uh, look into cloud like one cloud you can pick up any cloud right so build a small application and deploy it onto the cloud right? and deploy two microservices on the cloud and make them integrate with each other now there is a common problem right we all face the problem it runs on my machine as a developer but it doesn't run on the testers machine if it runs on the testers machine it my application fails so this is one common problem we, we used to face so what happened is we developed our project it's running well on my computer but it's not running well on my testers machine or it's not running well on the staging server or it breaks in the production server. so the problem is i'm confident my code is right but then the infrastructure or the software or the configuration on the other computer is creating a havoc to avoid this we have a docker so you can put the application along with your software onto a docker container and host it so that means you don't need to be worried about the application where it's going to run you can put it on a docker container and throw it onto the cloud it's going to work the same everywhere that's where you come into containerizing applications using docker so the on the customer's uh, machine you can easily dockerize the application and throw it you can dockerize the application and throw it onto the customer's machine and the machines may be different right the customer may be using a, a different infrastructure but still docker takes care of you know preventing all these failures and you know having the application along with the required software and configuration like it creates a, a box in which your applications run safely and docker takes care of uh, connecting to the host operating system Finally, you can uh, take the Docker image and deploy it onto an AWS cloud. So if you're looking at getting into uh, the mainstream full stack development, the roadmap would be do the back end with Spring Boot and microservices, do the front end with Angular, containerize your application and deploy it onto the cloud. You can pick up a cloud. Plus, look at our source code control management system. Like you can work with the uh, uh, Git or any uh, modern cutting edge uh, source code management system. You can also look at CI and CD, how to continuously integrate your application and how to continuously deploy your application. So we've had a complete picture and uh, we've really looked at uh, full stack from a 50,000 feet view. Uh, we have uh, uh, courses at uh, Colabra where we do all these steps. We really build uh, an application with uh, microservices architecture. Let's take like we take an e-commerce app. We'll build a couple of microservices like uh, let's say a product microservice. Uh, then uh, we'll have an offer microservice. And what happens is the product uh, microservice, offer microservice, and then a transaction microservice. And uh, you know run it as separate applications. We'll build a front-end application with Angular, connect them. Basically, this will all be with the CRUD application. It will basically uh, focus on create, read, update, and delete. That's what every application typically does to start with. 
and uh, we look at uh, deploying uh, our Spring Boot onto the cloud and you can um, log into your URL on your AWS account and you can show how an app runs. So end to end, uh, you know, a skeletal application would be built. You can deploy it onto the AWS cloud, which can also be added to your portfolio. We'll also be looking at how do we put uh, things into Docker so you can uh, really uh, gear yourself up to kickstart your development with the world of uh, Java microservices. And uh, that's the whole uh, uh, plan. And that's these are the things which are uh, packed into our uh, Collabra full stack uh, development with uh, Java microservices. So ideally, you will have a skeletal project which uh, covers all these things. So from end to end, you would be building a, uh, an app with all these technologies and deploying them. Although that would be a proof of concept of your understanding, but it also helps like on your portfolio, you can have a app up and running live, which would be a minimalistic application. Anyways, when we get into real world, we would dive deep in, but once you know end to end with the expertise which you have, you can definitely move on and build applications using microservices. Thanks everyone. Have a wonderful time. Dear organizer, thank you so much.